Hi, everybody. Um, again, my name is Byron, and when I look at this uh, projector, I can. This is a symbol of how precarious technology is. It looks like it's ready to fall off the stage, and that's a little bit related to my theme. Uh, Hank, thanks for allowing me to do this. This is pretty rare. You usually don't see people talking about the Rancho book in public places. It seems to be a kind of an inwardly looking uh, organization. So I'm, I'm more of an evangelist. I'm trying to move this out as a publisher, and I publish books about it. I'm also putting on a, a major conference. It's the first of its kind. It's an introductory conference. It's in mid-June. You can find out about it at our little booth over there. Um, Henry uh, and I were talking about publicity, and I said, you know, maybe there's a weird factor that you could use in your publicity because we have Mormon, Urantian, Raelian, Wiccan. Uh, I don't know if you use that for your publicity, but uh, there's a, a weird factor to this, but I think it's also pretty awesome to look at the scope of what the Urantia book is doing. As those that are into this think of it as a revelatory text, uh, I call it the Urantia Revelation. It's mainly called the Urantia Papers, the Urantia Book, published in 1955. And I'm going to just get right into this. There's a lot of slides, and my promise to, is to get through these slides before the, the heat death of the universe. So be, be patient with me. So go ahead. Is this clicking it forward? Yeah. Which uh, button? OK. So these are the key questions. Can the Rancher book be trusted as a source? Even if you don't accept its revelatory status, which is highly controversial, can you trust it? Secondly, were there transhumans in the past, or was there a transhumanist element of the distant past? And we're going to address that a lot here. Uh, will transhumans evolve in the future? So I use transhumans as a, a, a term uh, referring to ty a type of human. I prefer to think of it as a perfecting human or a, a transformed human, but I'll use the term transhumans as well. Uh, I'm going to use this working definition from Wikipedia. Transhumanism has a goal of fundamentally transforming the human condition with the use of technologies like this item, leading to such greatly expanded abilities as to merit the term post-human. Um, the premise I have is that only a spiritually and integrally of informed transhumanism is desirable and sustainable. <clears throat> I really mean transhumanism more in the sense of enhancement, as Ted Peters was talking about. Um, there are three factors that underlie this assumption or premise. One is uh, our ignorance of deep history, which the Ranch book fills in among many other things. Uh, there's a kind of uh, theological poverty um, and even spiritual poverty that is a conditioning element. Third, there's a contamination of transhumanism by reductionism and materialism, which I think it, it, it needn't have because it, there are many, uh, as Ted pointed out, there are religious elements and philosophic elements that are far beyond the kind of uh, materi gross materialism I find with some transhumanism. Uh, these are... Um, hypotheses that I'm working on. <clears throat> Those who read the text um, are often are thinking about these issues. One is this notion of ancient astronauts. That's not a, that's not a Urantia book term. It's a popular term, <coughs> this term of Anunnaki. How many have heard of Anunnaki? So the Anunnaki, so-called from uh, Sitchin's work, is roughly the same idea as in the Urantia book. There were beings who came here a long time ago. So that's one of them they interbred. That's one of the working uh, sort of hypotheses. Second, Adam and Eve were real beings, according to the Rancho book. They were genetic uplifters, and that's kind of the core of what I'm talking about today. Third, uh, <clears throat> it, with lacking celestial oversight, because such experiments now lack celestial oversight, they are prone to failure. Third, uh, fourth, Creating transhumans, if we take on such a project, requires ethical, spiritual depth that is now missing. It could be attained, but it's currently, obviously, to me, missing. And finally, um, spirituality, ET, celestial interaction, and afterlife, those domains I think of as being the place, where to place the transhumanist project, because I'm in, generally in, in the transhumanist project understood 
from the, from the evolutionary, spiritual, cosmic point of view. This is the book that Ted was talking about. I'll have copies out over there. They're still in the car, but um, I published this book really not knowing much about transhumanism. I was kind of amazed at what a big, important movement it is. Here's an, an endorsement by someone in the, in the movement that some of you may know. Uh, main features of the talk, I want to introduce the Rancher Revelation in a general way. Pretty tough to do in a half hour. We're going to look at what so-called genetic interventions in the distant past. We're going to look at scientific support for that claim in the Rancher book. <coughs> I'm going to try to offer a, a, a perspective, a, a, an integral perspective, and look at the future of trans, possible hu future of transhumanism. So what is the Urantia book? These are core ethical teachings. <coughs> God indwells each of us. This is a transcendent and imminent deity. It's a pan-entheistic philosophy. Uh, love God and others as yourself, the golden rule right out of the Bible. Soul ascension, also right out of Platonism and the Bible. Uh, the Urantia book has a massive um, detailing uh, revelation, in my view, of the afterlife, an eternal life, um, and that could be called post-human, definitely. Uh, the universe is evolutionary. What's interesting about the Rancher book uh, over the Bible and other scriptures, it is primarily an evolutionary text, and it has very deep, uh, deep evolutionary theory, the, the likes of which uh, still have not seen a match to that other than certain advanced post-modern the theologians are coming to what I think is the position of the Urantia book. But the Urantia book came out uh, in 1955. Uh, you can read this. This is uh, a typical quote from the Urantia book. <coughs> it, it speaks of other worlds that are inhabited by humans, in fact, trillions of them, and they have humanoid beings of different kinds, and all of them are searching for uh, their, their deity. Uh, the parts of the text, part one, is what I personally consider to be the revelatory part of the Arantia book. That is, it's, it can't be really um, matched with other human uh, ideas uh, except in broad outline. Part two is about the local universe. It states that the, there are local universes of inhabited planets. So of these trillions of inhabited planets, there are units of 10 million inhabited planets that are called local universes. Uh, part three is on the history of our planet. Urantia is the name of the planet. So there's a, a revealed history going back to deep, deep history, prehistory, very far prehistory. Part four, a lot of people don't know that the Urantia book has the purported angelic record of the life and teachings of Jesus. It's uh, 700 plus pages. And, and if you read anything, read that. Uh, so Uranch is the, their name for our planet. Their being the upstairs. <laughs> That's their name that they coined for the text. Uh, there's certain things that are spiritually incorrect, particularly in the Bay Area, about the Uranch book. One, God is a father, but also a mother. But this notion of God as a father is very prominent in the Uranch book. But it's a mother-father deity. Uh, that the divine is personal, and today we're supposed to not believe that, especially if you live in, like, Marin County. God is a, an impersonal, non-dual, uh, not something separate that's self-aware. Uh, the Rancher book states that the divine is self-aware deity. Third, that Jesus was incarnate deity, as claimed in Christianity. Um, <clears throat> Satan and Lucifer were real. That's the very con one of the very controversial parts of the Rancher book. It states that these beings were fallen angels, and we're going to get into that a lot more. And finally, that uh, reincarnation, which seems to be all the rage these days, is only a technical possibility in the Arantia book. It's mainly about soul ascension into the afterlife. Uh, there's politically incorrect parts of the Arantia book, in particular the genetic theory. Uh, the races do differ genetically. Um, that's what we're going to cover a little bit. Uh, third, uh, second, that Atlantis, what we call Atlantis, is actually what the Ranch Book calls the Garden of Eden. There was, um, a, there's a whole sto backstory on that I'm going to get to. Uh, it actually is an advocate of democratic world federation. And <coughs> for a text that really came through in the 30s, 40s, that's very early advocacy 
of a world uh, uh, government that's democratic, elected from, from below, not uh, an elite global government run from above, which we appear to have right now. <clears throat> and the Ranch book is very strong on philosophic spirituality that thinking um, is, is, is a route to the divine and it's, uh, it's deeply philosophic in the classical sense, drawing from Plato, Aristotle, Aquinas, and, and Hegel especially, uh, elements that you can see that are, that are philosophic. Um, there are mi misconceptions, <coughs> at least in my circles, you know, people often come up and say, man, this is just so weird, you, you must be an oddball, and it's thought that the Ranch book is for you know, oddball people, but the fact of the matter is it's actually a big hit in Latin America in the Spanish translation. It's selling very, very briskly in Latin America. It's in many other languages throughout the world. It's well known in France, well known in Germany in these translations. In many other translations, um, India, there's a lot of people reading in India. <coughs> it's an Arabic translation. There's a Chinese translation, Japanese translations. And so they're fanning out all over the world. So it's not just something that's a, you know, Bay Area strange people read it. It used to be though. Um, a lot of people, Think of the Urantia book as hopelessly obscure, sort of like reading Blavatsky, and, but actually as an editor, professional editor and publisher, I find it that it has sparkling prose. It's hard to find a sentence that it's not well constructed in 2,000 pages. It's it, it grammatically amazing. However, I would say as, as a, an editor, it's, it's an, an earlier generation of style. It's not really our current style uh, it's uh, longer sentences, is a uh, more complex structure, but <coughs> it's very sparkling prose and it's full of verifiable facts in science and history and other domains. Uh, third, that <coughs> people think of the Rancho book as too otherworldly, it's just too out there and too uh, sort of bizarre, but I, I, think it, uh, I think of it as kind of both otherworldly and very down to earth because the revelators, as we call them, the celestial authors, state that they extracted uh, from human thought 1,000 plus of the best ideas ever attained by humans, extracted those, and then wrote the text around those, and then went beyond those. And you can see elements from all kinds of thinkers, and people have done this, uh, both ancient uh, Greek philosophers, uh, medieval theologians, uh, and in uh, contemporary up until the time the Ranch book came through, which is in the mid 20th century, you can find the human sources. And there's a whole cottage industry of finding the human sources of the Rancho book, and it's a uh, quite interesting subject. And fourth, uh, a lot of people think the Rancho book is, you know, kind of older revelation, sort of like, uh, you know, sort of like, uh, you know, Blavatsky and things from the 19th century. It's often thought of it that way. And what has been happening is there's an update of its teachings that is now occurring since the 90s. There is a new, uh, new renditions of these teachings that are being transmitted through uh, to your ranch book readers. There's a massive uh, mediumship movement, li the likes of which I've never heard of because there's six, almost 60,000 pages of transcribed new materials that's a whole other subject. I've got a few books based on that. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but uh, the Ranch book was well known in the Haight-Ashbury, actually in the 60s. It got around, not sure how. Uh, Hendricks uh, loved the Ranch book. You can see in his biography. And Jared Garcia, I verified that because I live in San Rafael where he's, where he's from. And he loved the Ranch book and died with a copy next to his bed. Uh, Santana is a big proponent these days. And this is a quote from his Facebook site. He was reading the section about World Democratic Federation and posted that on his Facebook site. Uh, we found out <coughs> that Clinton was a ranch book student. And I know this because uh, somebody in, in uh, Special Forces was being decorated by him in the Oval Office some years ago. And this guy, this student, a special ops guy, was a Urantia reader, and he saw on Clinton's desk an open Urantia book. He also was decorated a second time. The same guy went back and saw and talked to Clinton. So twice this guy has uh, talked to him, and Clinton said he really loves the book. And his, his book was dog-eared and had coffee stains and that sort of thing. 
Uh, Patu Bantan, if any of you are into reggae, for some reason, a lot of reggae people are into the Rancha book. He's, he is uh, just quit being a uh, touring uh, artist and is now a touring minister. Uh, these are all translations, Russian, German, Korean, etc. So why, um, you know, you ask, well, why do we need some revelatory text and these claims usually turn out to be fraudulent, hoaxes, you know, bizarre things, you know, channeled material. So really, it's, I think there, there's this notion, in the Ranch book at least, that <coughs> you have evolution, which is a natural process. And the Ranch book has, in its part three, an amazing uh, account of evolution from over billions of years leading up to what it calls the implantation of life, single cells, that have all genetic potentials. Um, and these are allowed, uh, these things are allowed to evolve naturally according to sort of more or less Darwinian laws. <coughs> but at a certain point, superhumans intervene. And they do this because there's a kind of rhythm of evolution and revelation. Also, the Ranch Book says that there is a revelatory dimension to all human life that we are receiving under the right conditions. Revel revelation, they call it auto-revelation. Uh, this is, you know, basically a Christian notion of grace. And the Rancher book claims that there are five great uh, uh, revelations. We can look at that in a second. <coughs> and it, it, in particular, this is the operation of divine grace, that in times of great travail, there will be a revelation. However, they usually wait till the last minute, from what I can tell. So they allow uh, things to get very dire, uh, to the point that people are ready and sort of on their knees, so to speak, and then a gift will be given. And it's purported that the Rancho book was given in anticipation of the ravages of World War II. And it was really completed during World War, War II. We can talk about how it was coming through. And so it was given uh, in recognition of the, um, of the travail of World War II. Um, this is a you can't read. I've got a handout uh, back there for you. Uh, it, this is my chart of the entire thing in one page, and it uh, it covers the his history dim dimension. Um, so the first, I said there were five epical revelations. First one is 500,000 years ago. It is something referred to by Zechariah Sitchin. If any of you read his his many books. He says there was an intervention by the Anunnaki half a million years ago. So it's an odd match with him uh, because also Sitchin states, based on the cuneiform tablets, that there was a rebellion against these Anunnaki uh, 200,000 years ago. And oddly, the ranch book has the same date for a re uh, rebellion. However, it diverges and it, it states that there were these supernatural beings, Lucifer and Satan, who led a rebellion of the angels. Uh, it says that not only was our planet um, involved in this, that is the angels of the planet involved in this, but 37 planets total in the local universe followed a rebellion. Uh, the angels of the earth, for the most part, went over to the rebellion. And uh, as a result of this, <coughs> after giving all beings all uh, angels, uh, and there's a huge angelic uh, hierarchy in the Arantia book. When they all had their chance to decide which side they'd be on, uh, then the, these planets were quarantined from other planets. And it's a long story why, but um, they were all quarantined and we were quarantined as well. Um, and we're gonna talk about the quarantine in a minute. This is the purported location of this arrival of these ancient astronauts. That's the Persian Gulf. And it's a place they call Dalmatia. This is, again, a revelatory intervention of beings who come down to teach. Uh, the second, we're going to run this quick, come back to it again. The second of these divine interventions was much, much, much later. 37,000 years ago, in this location, <coughs> uh, this is Cyprus, present-day Cyprus, Syria. Uh, we're calling it Atlantis here. It's actually in the ranch book called 
Eden. Um, the mission of this second great event was race blending. Um, this mission failed. Why? Because there had been an angelic rebellion and there was a dark side component that um, interfered with it. Uh, we'll get to this some more. <clears throat> uh, there's a third intervention, according to Rancho book, much, much, much later again. And some of you know from reading the Bible that in Genesis there's a being named Melchizedek. And, uh, is a, and Jesus is referred to as a priest after the order of Melchizedek. There's not much about it. There's a lot of myth about it. Uh, according to Ranch book, Melchizedek was a real personality. The Bible speaks of him entering into the tent that Abraham was in, stating, you know, you're going to become the founder of this new, new lineage, which became the Hebrews. And the Ranch book says he's a real person, but that's beyond the scope of our discussion. Uh, there's a fourth great epical revelation, and this is the incarnation of Christ. Basically, this uh, <coughs> Christian beliefs are about him are generally correct, according to the Urantia book. Uh, the Urantia book contains this revealed biography. The one thing it rejects from Christian theology is the blood atonement doctrine. It vociferously uh, rejects that doctrine as a pagan doctrine that was imported. Uh, the so-called fifth epical revelation, Urantia book, um, uh, this uh, group here were the core group. This man here is uh, Dr. William Sadler, who's a uh, physician and psychiatrist. He taught at University of Chicago. He, uh, they brought him this phenomenon to debunk, and he was a debunker of spiritualism, but he could not debunk it, and so he joined it. And he became the leader. This is his son, his wife, and their kind of uh, secretary and these are the people known as the Contact Commission. They had direct celestial contact. This group here is the original group that were the recipients of the materials. These materials, briefly, would, would come through an unknown subject. Uh, some people think it was Edgar Cayce, and it's something like the Edgar Cayce phenomenon. However, there's no evidence of him speaking it. The, Evidence seems to be that these chapters materialized. I know it sounds weird, but there's historians working on this. <coughs> the, this group would ask questions. They would read a chapter, ask questions, and the Celestials would revise it based on the Q&A. And this went on for over 20 years in secret until they had 196 chapters. This is a big editorial project ending up with 2,000 pages. Uh, the current epic is known as the correcting time. This 1111 is a whole other subject we shouldn't get into today, but <coughs> the, what we're being told now in these update transmissions is the Rancher book is the textbook, and we, the Celestials, are teaching from a textbook, and we're updating it. And that's called the correcting time, and that's correcting the errors of our history because of the rebellion, the Lucifer Rebellion. Uh, these are some books I published on it. And this new era is called the Magisterial Mission. It's controversial, actually, within the Urantia uh, community. Uh, so <clears throat> the Urantia book has a cosmology that is a notion that the universe has a center. And I actually wrote a paper for Ted when I was a student of his at Berkeley, uh, Ted and Bob Russell, in a course there on this. And uh, the, uh, it's something Einstein considered, that the universe has a center around which things rotate. Of course, a center is not literally a center. It's outside of space and time. But um, there, here's some illustration of it, um, that the, uh, this center, which is outside of space and time, has all, these, all the galaxies rotating around it. They're also, we have the, the uh, Hubble redshift, they're, they're expanding outward, but they're also rotating counterclockwise. Uh, this is another artist's rendition. So this is the, the center 
of the universe, which is called the central or the mother universe. That is the source universe of the Big Bang and of evolution. Uh, outside of it are um, galaxies that are um, inhabited. And then outside of that are uninhabited galaxies. Now here's another version of this, and, and this is an artist's representation showing the center, which is non -vis not visible in reality, and, uh, oops, sorry, uh, and rotating around it counterclockwise are these inhabited galaxies, and ours is, uh, is right here. And uh, this is not quite correct because they're actually galaxy clusters. And I can't remember the local galaxy clusters. Anybody remember the name of that? It's, there's a <coughs> cluster of galaxies that we are rotating around. And uh, anyway, uh, uh, anyway, I can't remember the name. But it is believed by Urantians, some of us, that that galaxy cluster is this, uh, this, gal this group here. These are all inhabited. And they're ro it's rotating around itself and then rotating around the center. And also there's the, the redshift outward, so there's a lot going on there. Um, this is another depiction of it. These uh, bands of galaxies are the, like the great wall in current uh, astronomy, and they're purported, they're stated to be uninhabited, but the, the inner group of galaxies are inhabited uh, or actually inhabited. So this is a depiction of the central domain, and this is the locus of deity, but deity is highly self-distributed, so it's not just in the center, uh, but this is the focus of it, and they use some of our mythic terms like paradise. It's known as the Isle of Paradise. So I think of this as cosmo, this is my term, cosmotheocentrism. <coughs> the divine is at the center, but it's also at all points in space, it's omnis, omnicentric, but there's also a true center. It's panentheistic, it's Trinitarian. This is an amazing thing for Christians, is to look at the Trinitarian theology of the Arantia book, which I think is a huge contribution and unacknowledged. Um, the divine is presented as personal, but also highly transcendent to personal. Uh, it's canonic in the technical term for self-distributing deity. So deity is so self-distributing that um, there's a part of deity in each of us, actually a real fragment, a God fragment in each person, and it's a friendly universe. Um, this is quickly organization. There's seven great super universes that are inhabited. These are galaxy clusters, and uh, you can see the rest, and it claims that there are seven trillion inhabited planets, so it's kind of a Star Trek cosmology. Uh, local uh, systems, are 1,000 worlds, and that's important for what we're going to say here. There are types of planets, and uh, very quickly, um, ours is a, an atmospheric type, and um, most planets are have atmospheres, but some planets do not have atmospheres, and those are called uh, non-breather planets. And it t it states, and this is one of the verifiable things in the Rancher book. It states there's a non-breather planet with beings in our solar system. And some Urantians think it's a moon of, of one of the outer planets that has no atmosphere. And there's uh, other types. For example, uh, you can classify planets by gravity. So if it's a huge planet, what size would the beings be? They'd have to be smaller. They'd have to be shorter, right, because there's more gravity. So on these big planets, people are two feet tall. On little planets, you're taller because there's not as much gravity. So you can be up to seven feet tall. And uh, there's more to it, but uh, you can buy a Urantia book at half off and read more about it. Uh, normal planets <coughs> evolve in stages. Life isn't planted from the outside. Life is designed. It's design or revolution, so to speak. It's designed with all the potentials for the planet. And in our case, our planet was dissolved with genetic potentials that were experimental. But most planets are not. They're, they're kind of standard genes adapted to the planet's material conditions. Does it have an atmosphere? Does it have oceans? And they, these higher beings design a single cell. They implant it in various places. It evolves over billions of years. 
Uh, second is humans evolve very much longer, later. Third, as I mentioned, off-planet beings come, and according to Rancher Book, they establish a capital. Fourth, there is a biological revelation. It's a genetic intervention, something like the Anunnaki. Fifth, there are bestowals. This is like Jesus, Krishna, avatars. There's a stage of sustainability when the planet becomes socially sustainable and, and culturally advanced. Final is a planet-wide enlightenment. Uh, so again, uh, let's look at this another way. Uh, typical, you would have a billion years, roughly, life comes from the outside. Then you'd have primitive humans evolving after a very long time, which is what we see in our evolutionary theory. Uh, halfway through, you get a, a headquarters, then you get an Adam and Eve, and then you get advanced light, what they call light and life. <coughs> Ours is atypical. So we are an atypical planet. That's why the Rancher book is so bizarre, really, because it's explaining what makes us atypical. And um, what happened with us is a default of this event and a failure of this event and a likelihood of um, civilization collapse today. <clears throat> That's why an extraordinary intervention is required. The Ranch book is the first part of that, purportedly. So I'm going to run through these. There's evidence of, we can't do all of it, of course. I'm almost out of time. There's evidence of a location of this Eden. There is evidence of crossbreeding in scientific work on genetics. There's uh, this uh, find that corroborates the ranch book. We don't have time for that one. There are Sumerian artifacts that corroborate, and there will be someday underwater archaeology uh, in the Persian Gulf. It's being planned today. In the first visitation, we spoke of this. <coughs> the, there was a rebellion, as I mentioned, um, and there was a crossbreeding of those beings, known as the Nephilim, from Genesis. Those are the giants who were in the earth in those days. This is, again is that location. And this is the being that the Urantia book identifies as the devil in myth. I just found this picture. It's not what he looks like. Uh, this, is a, this is a supernatural being who comes here to be the planetary director. Uh, he joined the rebellion. Uh, now his staff were super mortals. So as Sitchin says in his literature, there were super beings came down. Same idea. They, in, they become embodied and they, they can interbreed. And <coughs> these beings had with them something called the tree of life. So the tree of life is a, a historically real um, a phenomenon. Lucifer is uh, represented here. They then abort this mission. His manifesto <clears throat> is, I'll let you read that, God is a myth. Uh, the universe is self-existing. No creator. Inhabited planets should be autonomous. Our planet seceded from the universe administration. Uh, this rebellion um, was we were in quarantine until very recently when there was a heavenly court case that adjudicated the case, 1985. <clears throat> this refers to something many people wonder about. How does it Cain, after he, after he murdered Abel, could leave Eden and go to Nod, where there was not supposed to be anybody else on the planet? There was a land of Nod, and he took a wife, if you recall. The ranch book says there was a land of Nod. Those were renegade Anunnaki. Uh, let's skip this. They procreated. They're the Nephilim. Uh, this is my personal hypothesis, is that this group known as the Nodites, who occupied an area north of Mesopotamia for many thousands of years, they had identified with the Luciferian rebellion they're the source of the so-called Illuminati bloodlines. Your ranch book people don't believe this. I happen to believe it. Uh, again, these are the Nephilim. 
and the central region of these nodites over many thousands of years, uh, their descendants were the Sumerians, and this is a long time later. This is, oops, this is the uh, tree of life. Um, so let's finish up with this, Adam and Eve. This is them getting pissed off at God. Uh, and uh, Carol Queen might like this. This is uh, Adam and Eve is kind of like a deity pair of male-female. <laughs> so their first appearance was 37,000 years ago on Cyprus. They were forced out of Eden and went to Mesopotamia because there was warfare from the Nodites who were nearby in Syria who made war upon them. And there's three elements here uh, of their purpose. One is to inject into ev uh, the evolutionary uh, genome their genetics. It's a higher genetics. It's not much higher, but it's like a transhumanist project, but it's by intermarriage of their children. Second is <coughs> what I just said, and third is a racial blending, and uh, this uh, great golf player, golf player is a, an example of racial blending. There's multiple races uh, coming through, and, and racial blending is seen as the ranch book as a very good thing to do for evolution because you get diversity in the gene pool. Um, so correlation with the Bible, we've already covered. Uh, this was occurred in Mesopotamia. There's a tree of life. They had to leave. Those are the, similar to the Bible. This is dissimilar. The Rancher book says Adam and Eve were interdimensional beings on a transhumanist project. They were not the parents of mankind. There was already human beings here, etc. So it's also similar in Sumerian myth, Adam and Eve and a tree. Now this is a whole new development, scientific support for the idea that there was a genetic intervention. <clears throat> and um, this is uh, on the, something called the microcephalin gene and a science uh, magazine, pretty advanced uh, magazine, a journal. These are the findings. This gene is uh, discovered to be something injected 37,000 years ago, single source, introduced in Mesopotamia. You can read the article. Ranch book says that they brought enhanced brain function in their genes 37,000 years ago, single source, and it was between the Tigris and Euphrates. Uh, so there's, in addition to finish up, <clears throat> there was an expedition uh, I was part of to see if we could find this sunken land. The ranch book says that uh, actually, this is what one researcher found, is that the, what the Rancher book calls Eden matches what Plato calls Atlantis. All 50, almost all 50 things he states about it. Empire. Out of time? Okay. This is the location. You can talk to me about it later. Uh, this is the expedition. And it was picked up by the History Channel a few years ago and covered as well. There were two expeditions to the site. Thank you, everybody.